Welcome to Industry Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market each day. It's Monday, October 29th. I'm your host, Jason Moser, and joining me in the studio today is certified financial planner, Matt Frankel. Matt, you are back from Las Vegas in South Carolina. I hope it feels good to be home. It does. I it was it's always fun being away for a few days, but then you you know, I start to miss my kids and you know, sadly. I, I don't like traveling as much as I used to. I, I, I hear you. I, I, I do feel that same way. Uh, yeah, it's just always nice to get back to the family at home. I mean, hey, it was a good weekend all the way around, right? I mean, yeah, you, 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 your Gamecocks took it to the Tennessee Volunteers, uh, Wofford Terriers won, and then, hey, listen, congratulations, Boston Red Sox. That was an awesome World Series win right there. I was happy to see that. And my Philadelphia Eagles won in in England. So, oh, you're an Eagles guy, huh? I am New oh, Jersey, born good, and raised. Good, good. All right. Well, uh, hey, listen. On today's show, we're going to talk more about earnings. We'll tap into Twitter, of course, and we'll have one to watch as always. But we're going to start the show today with money, and by that I mean the Money 2020 show uh, that Matt. Uh, attended last week in Las Vegas. He uh, was there working nonstop for us to get a lot of great information. Had some interviews, uh, just just really a, a lot to get to. So let's go ahead and just kick it off with a story we talked about before: the Ultra FICO rating. And we know that that FICO was looking to add this Ultra FICO rating, which was going to take into consideration the way people manage their checking accounts and savings accounts, uh, and incorporate that into their credit score. And I think we both probably. The first, the first uh, inclination was to look at this maybe with a little bit of skepticism. But Matt, you were able to speak with uh, some folks out there at the Money Twenty Twenty show. Tell us a little bit more about this Ultra FICO and what you learned. Yeah, I had a long conversation with the head of scores at FICO, um, and they kind of shed some light on some of this. So, this is designed to help two key groups. First is kind of younger people or people who may not have much of an established credit history. Um, for example, if you've never used a credit card, you've never you know gotten a mortgage, you you might have either a terrible FICO score or no FICO score, depending on how little credit you've used. And that's that is somewhat unfair to customers like that who, under traditional means, we have no way of assessing how well they handle their money. So that's group one, and group two are people who are rebuilding their credit. Not people with bad credit, but people who have had a couple of dings a few years ago, maybe, and now are just getting back on their feet and kind of just need an extra boost to kind of show how they're behaving lately. Um, just to kind of be clear, uh, one thing FICO shared with me is that the vast majority of this formula is still going to be the traditional FICO reporting metrics, such as you know your payment history, the amounts you owe on your accounts, the length of your credit history, and so on. So. For people with bad credit, this isn't going to make the difference between getting approved or not. If you have terrible credit, you're still going to have terrible credit under this ultra FICO score. But it's meant to just give a boost to people, especially in those two groups, who really just, for one reason or another, the general FICO, the regular FICO formulas may not reflect their real credit risk. That's a good point there. You know, I think about uh, the 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 common observation is when you are a student, uh, maybe 18, 19, 20 years old, you probably haven't had a chance to develop any kind of a credit history because you haven't had the need to borrow for a car or a house or or you know, perhaps respond to a credit card solicitation in the mail. So, I mean, if this is something that that they can use to actually help establish someone, I mean, that does make sense. If you're going through pretty reliable data there, the way someone might manage their checking account and or savings account, I mean, you do have to know how to balance those books to make sure you're not overdrafting the account or whatever. So, that, that, that actually is a good thing. I think one thing I, I also saw uh, today, this morning, I noticed, is Capital One Financial and Discover Financial Services both, at this point, seem to be pulling back a little bit on credit offerings. Uh, essentially, the, both companies noting that right now it seems like everything is looking pretty darn good, and consumers are feeling confident. Unemployment is low. This is a great, great time uh, to, to to be out there making some money and spending it. But but they're thinking a little bit forward, and and really this is more from a risk perspective. They're trying to keep you know a lid on this thing getting out of control, and perhaps that that ultra FICO can help that as well. Yeah, definitely. And it's not just um, overdraft history. Uh, they told me there's actually a lot of banking information considered in this. Uh, savings behavior is one thing, 
whether consumers are there, they've had a steadily growing average balance, say, for the past few years, things like that. So they say that the data really backs this up that these behaviors that they're going to be looking at really do predict financial performance. And they also said that they have a ton of financial institutions, both big and small, that are very interested in this to kind of expand their the prime lending base. So while I'm still he- approaching this with a healthy level of skepticism um, in terms of will it increase default risk, but it definitely serves a purpose, I could say, after talking to them. Well, that's good. That's nice to see both sides of it. Um, okay, this uh, Goldman Sachs uh, Marcus, apparently they are looking to try to help uh, consumers and or businesses manage debt a little bit more wisely. You had a chance to uh, take a look at, at this Marcus offering that, that they have, learn more about it. Uh, tell, tell me what your takeaways with Goldman Sachs and Marcus are. Well, the wealth management offering that they're coming up with is still very much a work in progress. Um, I spoke with one of their executives, and he said that it's not just going to be a robo advising platform. It's definitely going to have some sort of active component. And then I kind of asked him kind of more in depth where Marcus is going. They had mentioned a bunch of possible growth avenues, say mortgages, auto loans, checking accounts, things like that. And he said, that even though they kind of have the capital and the ability to grow as fast as they want to, they're still just going to focus on their core businesses that they've had so far, which is online savings accounts and personal lending, both of which they feel have tremendous runway still. Um, They shared a couple of stats with me that uh, 70% of people in a recent survey don't know that you can pay off credit cards with personal loan proceeds. Uh, about 60% don't know what their savings account interest rate is. So they see a big opportunity with just educating the consumer and kind of building up the products that they already offer. Um, and that they're going to kind of cautiously roll out new products as they see fit. Wealth management is just the next avenue. And while other things like mortgages, credit cards, things like that could be coming in the future, I wouldn't count on seeing. Any kind of accelerated timetable. I mean, you, you got to realize that Marcus itself is just about two years old. Um, as I was talking to them on that day, they had, they were celebrating um, two years since their first personal loan was issued. So they're still a very young platform, um, and are still trying to really establish their core competencies, and aren't really inclined to grow that fast. Well, I think I can get behind that. I mean, one thing that always just Takes me a bit by surprise is is when you when you look at look at the bigger picture. I mean, a lot of people out there really just don't understand how finance works. I mean, from something as basic to a checking account or a savings account to uh, taking out a loan or even what what your what your taxes are going towards, how much you pay in taxes and filing taxes every year. I mean, I just have done a lot of research on this through the years, and um, I had the good fortune back in 2012, I think it was, to interview then Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, and he agreed. I mean, really, the biggest hurdle to clear uh, in regard to Individuals in in the United States and in finance is just simple education, and, and states aren't doing a good enough job of it through school systems. Um, it, it's not something where you can just say, "Okay, we're going to implement this nationwide uh, financial literacy program, and that'll take care of it." Uh, really, I mean, my observation, at least as a father, and 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 through what we do as, as uh, employees here, is it really all does start in the home and the biggest problem there is when you're a parent and you don't know enough to teach your child or children about those basic financial concepts uh, then you're really stuck so it certainly sounds like Marcus is uh, leaning more towards the education side and helping people make smarter decisions and I think we we can all get behind that uh, now when we look at this next topic I, I think this is one that we you and I both uh, support no question and it's one for whatever reason or another we just don't see as many women in money and finance as you would think 
Uh, if you listen to Lou Anne Lofton, she wrote a terrific book about uh, Warren Buffett, How He Invests Like a Girl. Uh, I recommend anyone out there who hasn't read it, uh, just check it out. Lou Anne is a longtime favorite of ours here at The Fool. And uh, just bottom line is women are really good with money, really smart with money. It seems like we should have more in this profession, but, but for whatever reason, we don't. You. Uh, had the opportunity to interview the Money 2020 president, Tracy Davies. Talk to me about what you learned. Well, Money, Miss Davies is really trying to push for inclusion on all levels. They're just kind of trying to start with gender. Uh, it makes sense. You know, women are kind of the biggest minority pool out there, it's 50% of the population. Um, finance is an industry that generally has not been very inclusive traditionally. Um, if I ask everybody who's listening to close their eyes and think of a, say, investment bank's boardroom, you're probably picturing a bunch of old white men sitting around a table. <laughs> so it's, and there's a reason for that because historically that's been the case. Now, over the past, say, couple decades or so, they've done a very good job of kind of becoming a more inclusive industry as a whole, but we need to do better. Uh, Miss Davies shared with me that only about twenty percent of leadership roles, meaning executive positions in finance, com- in fin- the financial sector, are held by women. Only about twenty percent. So they're starting what's called this Rise Up Initiative, and it's basically the way she described it was an accelerator for ambitious women who want to get in- get their start in the financial industry. And basically, you they apply to this program, they go to the Money 2020 conference that I was at, and they're in this program, and they have very great, like unprecedented one-on-one access with leaders, both male and female, in the financial industry. Um, Just kind of seminars. One was how to call it ascending to the C-suite that I saw. Uh, It's a very intimate program, only about only 30 people this year. They're planning on expanding it somewhat, but still keeping it pretty small. so it's really nice to see these initiatives. Um, like I said, they're only starting with gender. They're planning on you know appro- embracing all kinds of inclusiveness. But this program, it was in its first year, and she said they had too much interest, which is a great problem to have. Um, it's really nice to see. And like I said, the financial industry has been doing great. We have to do better with being inclusive, and it's really nice to see them taking a step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree with you one hundred percent. And speaking as the father of uh, two young daughters, uh, I mean, I, I just I get excited when I think about the opportunities that they're going to have as they get older. Um, they they both always tell me they want to work at the Motley Fool. I think they just they see how much fun I have with my job, so they figure, hey, why not? Uh, and, and hey, I want that I want that possibility to exist. I want them to have uh, the the world at their at their fingertips. I tell you another. A uh, good, great advocate for women in finance, Sally Krawcheck. You can follow her on Twitter uh, at Sally Krawcheck. But she is also, um, I, I think, co-founder or founder of this platform, Elvest, which is essentially women in finance. It's the same basic message, and it's it's giving women a place to learn more, to be more, to grow more, to get to get uh, take advantage of the opportunities out there. So certainly, uh, something we can all get behind and. Uh, we look forward to the opportunities to bring more women in finance to to our ranks here at the Motley Fool. So that's uh, great. I'm glad you had the, had the chance to 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 speak with Tracy out there. Uh, okay, let's yeah, and, talk. Um, actually, before we go on, she asked me to share her email if any of our listeners might be interested. Absolutely. in Absolutely. Yeah, please give us that. Uh, sure, it is Tracy T R A C E Y at Money Twenty Twenty dot com. Terrific. Excellent. Well, hopefully, we have some listeners out there that uh, can reach out, learn more. Uh, Green Dot, probably a company that not a lot of folks out there have on their radar, but it is a publicly traded company, and it's actually been on the public markets for a little while. Um, I do remember looking at this company when it first went public, Matt, and there were just some questions I had in regard to really uh, the total market opportunity and, and, and the trends of what they were pursuing. And, you know, you, you made a point here in that they're targeting the group of consumers that are most likely to still use cash. But what were the the takeaways from your uh, time learning about Green Dot at the conference? Sure. So, Green Dot's oldest and most visible business, they've been around for 20 years now, are prepaid debit cards. Um, particularly if you ever shop at Walmart, those prepaid the money cards that are at the checkout, those are all Green Dot products. Yep. Um, so, that's what they're known for. But they also provide, say, um, a checking account product for people who don't have a traditional checking account. And they're also 
really emphasizing what they call their banking as a service platform, which is if you're a company that needs, say, a peer to peer payment app or something like that, it's really expensive and in most cases undesirable to actually become a bank. Um, we've heard some talk about maybe Amazon offering a banking product. Amazon will never become a bank. They they may partner with a bank to offer the Amazon branded checking account, but they're not going to become a bank. It's too it's prohibitively, it, you know, they want that regulatory oversight, the costs is associated with it, things like that. So what Green Dot does is they let companies kind of piggyback off their infrastructure and their technology to offer the piece of banking that they want to, and not become a bank. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples. Um, Uber allows their drivers to have payment accounts that where they can get paid whenever they want to from their their uh, rides that is powered by Green Dot's infrastructure. The peer to peer end of Apple's Apple Cash, or I'm sorry, Apple Pay Cash, the peer to peer platform on Apple is powered by Green Dot. Huh. Just re- uh, TurboTax is um, the uh, uh, preloaded debit cards with tax refunds are powered by Green Dot. So these companies that kind of need banking products and services but don't want to become a bank themselves. They use Green Dot, and like I mentioned, these are the customers who are most likely to be like kind of the last holdouts of the cash economy. People with you know an American Express card and a Wells Fargo checking account, like me, are I I charge I use card payments or mobile payments for most purchases now. People without those things are the most likely to use cash for everyday purchases. So when we're talking about war on cash investments. Green Dot's a really interesting play because they're targeting the people that use cash the most. So they have a huge addressable market there. Well, that's always nice to hear. I mean, that's one of the things we look for in all of our investments is huge market opportunities. And it sounds like Green Dot certainly still has one. Okay. And and lastly, we want to talk a little bit about uh, American Express tying up here with Amazon. Uh, this is. If if I'm reading correctly, this is primarily a business relationship. From what I could see, the one thing that took me, uh, or that I at least found noteworthy, was it didn't look like there was any type of annual fee involved with this relationship. And that's you know, American Express is pretty notorious for that annual fee. Uh, but talk a little bit more about the uh, American Express and Amazon tie up, and what exactly that's going to mean for both companies. Sure. This was actually probably my favorite announcement there, just because um, I'm a huge Shark Tank fan, and Barbara Corcoran was the the kind of spokesperson giving this announcement. <laughs> That's a good show. So, I like it too. <laughs> yeah, on a, on a personal level, I really enjoyed this announcement. But yes, you're correct. It's a business card. This is not a personal credit card product. Um, and yes, it's no annual fee. But the most unique thing is that cardholders have a choice. On one hand, they could choose to get five percent rewards. This is Amazon Prime members. 5% rewards on any Amazon purchase, including Whole Foods, or they can choose to have 90-day payment terms. Now, what's really unique about this is this is not just 90-day interest-free payments. This is 90 days of no payments, meaning that you charge something and your bill without any interest comes due in 90 days. So, this is a really big benefit for business who have cash flow issues. Let's say you sell something to somebody, you need to you know, finance the the costs of goods to make whatever you're selling, but then you're not going to get paid for a couple months. This really allows you to manage your cash flow so much better without that extra expensive credit card interest or any payments due at all until your receivables come in. So that's I don't know of any other credit card that has zero payments for 90 days. Um, there's a lot of interest-free credit cards, but you still have to make minimum payments along the way. So that was kind of the big takeaway I saw, and it's a no annual fee product, which is and five percent cash back if you choose that route, is a great rewards rate rate for a no annual fee credit card to begin with. So there's a couple of big perks to this for for small businesses. Yeah, that's a couple of really. Uh behemoth companies in the space, so to speak, that are really uh, looks like they're tackling a what is a problem with a unique and compelling solution. I have to believe that they should uh, gain a little traction with that. Um, now, Matt, one more thing. I know you. I mean, it was a busy week for you, obviously. You know, you had a lot of stuff. You're probably still digging through all your notes. Uh, you've got an article, at least one article, coming out here soon with with a lot of your money 2020 observations, right? Yeah, I actually have two. I have a, a Green Dot article um, about kind of a little deeper dive into that company, which should be out tomorrow. And then there's one, my an interview article with uh, the head of brand for Marcus, 
Uh, I'm waiting on a couple of quote approvals from them just to make sure I quoted them correctly because I can't read my own writing in a few cases. <laughs> so I'm just, there's a there's a small delay on that, but it should be out any any day now. Great, good stuff. We'll make sure and get that tweeted out on the uh, industry focus feed, so all of our listeners can get a chance to check it all out. Um, okay, let's take a uh, moment and look back at the week that was in earnings. Uh, earnings season is still uh, still going going strong, and we had a few companies that we that we keep on our radar here uh, that announced last week. And we'll go ahead and open with Visa. Uh, Visa. I mean, I'll just give you my quick takeaway looking at it. I mean, this you don't really want to read too terribly much into what this company is doing because it's kind of a uh, you know if it ain't broke, don't fix it situation, I guess. But I mean, you look at Visa payments volume was up eleven percent, transactions were up twelve percent. Uh, we talked about this before. They did raise the dividend uh, prior to the announcement. I for one have been critical that they should raise their dividend more when you look at the amount of money they've spent on share repurchases versus what they've given shareholders. As dividends, but I mean, you know, it's still working out either way, right? They're bringing the share count down. What what stood out to to, to you in the quarter? I'm just uh, well, thirty four percent jump in earnings, which a lot of that is tax reform, but not as much as you might think. Um, the twelve percent boost in revenue that you just mentioned was kind of really what stood out to me, um, and that's with some foreign exchange headwinds as well. Um, so that's the impressive growth. The revenue growth is the really impressive thing to notice with pretty much all of these financial earnings, since we're still less than a year in from tax reform. Um, Visa still growing at a double digit rate. They're anticipating growing at a double digit rate, and that's another company I had a chance to briefly speak with at Money, and they couldn't stop talking about just how much untapped opportunity there is, especially in overseas markets, and. Um, they mentioned something like 70% of transactions still take place in cash. So if you think that the card market is getting saturated, think again. There's still a lot of <laughs> runway here. Yeah, I, I remember. Uh, I, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but just in the time we lived in Egypt, in, you know, for three years in, in uh, early 2000s, and then onward to, in in Kazakhstan. I mean, those were two economies that were we just it was plainly they just ran uh, so much on cash. I mean, they just didn't have that infrastructure yet. And so yeah, when you look at it from a global perspective, I mean, you certainly do understand the opportunity that still exists and how many dollars. Are, uh, are are flowing through those networks today, and how many will be flowing uh, flowing through them in, in the next ten years? I'm just just make make companies like that so attractive. Uh, uh, Sil- Silicon Valley Bank, maybe maybe a company that most of our listeners might not be as familiar with, but but you are familiar with it. Tell me uh, what your takeaways from the quarter were. Yeah, so they beat on earnings, but the stock like plunged right after the report. Um, which kind of looks puzzling at first, but when you dig into it, this is a bank that has been really a beneficiary of its Silicon Valley Bank Corp of kind of the booming economy of startups and things like that in Silicon Valley. And because of that, because of their relationship with all the startups and venture capital out there, they get a big low cost deposit base, which has been growing rapidly. This quarter, the deposit growth was just about 2%, which kind of is not as good as investors were hoping for. Uh, interest margins, because they have a big, low-cost deposit base and rates are rising. Everyone wanted to see margins expand a little more than they did. I think they only expanded by about three basis points. So, well, on the surface, it looks good, and the bank's still growing at a pretty impressive level. The numbers just quite weren't what investors were looking for. Well, it happens, right? That happens. It does. <laughs> um, and another one, I got a few questions uh, on Twitter last week about this one, so I wanted to make sure we gave it a little bit of attention. Ellie May, a uh, company I'm a big fan of. I know a lot of our members and listeners uh, are fans of it too. Uh, the stock just got shellacked after after earnings uh, came out last week. Uh, fell somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty percent or so, a little maybe maybe a little bit less, seventeen eighteen uh, percent. And, and I, I think this is one where the bark was much worse than the actual bite. I don't think things are nearly as bad as that sell off would have you believe. But with that said, I mean what we're seeing play out is really one of the biggest risks that we called out in investing in this company. And Ellie May being the mortgage software provider uh, has really benefited from this just huge stretch of low interest rates where people are refinancing, it seems like, on an annual basis. Um, and, and so, with rates starting to go back up, the refinance volume is drying up, and, and they need to make up for that lost volume on the purchase side. But, of course, you know, I mean, purchases are only going to take, take, uh, take care of so 
much here. And so, you know, management, they guided back on full year revenue guidance. They guided back on the actual number of contracted seats uh, that they see filling out for 2018. So those clearly aren't good things. They tell us that things are slowing down a little bit. But by the same token, I mean, we're looking at a company they they actually gained one percent in terms of volume expansion in the face of a market that was down 13 percent. So they're maintaining and actually picking up a little bit of share in what is a very tough market. They do see the housing market getting a little bit better uh, in in the coming months, going into spring of 2019, I think one of the biggest challenges right now is a lack of inventory out there for uh, entry level home buyers. Uh, but but the bottom line is that when you look at the actual business itself, uh, they're continuing to do good things. They're growing the active users. They're closing more loans. They're they're taking the the revenue per closed loan is is on the rise. So these are all good things. I think that uh, you know we're witnessing a bit more of a macro thing as opposed to a business thing. If you don't own shares of LA May and you always wanted to, I think this is probably your good opportunity to at least take a closer look. Uh, for full disclosure, I own shares of LA May. I didn't sell them. I'm not going to sell them. I love this business. I'm going to hang on to them. Uh, definitely, you know, some, some macro concerns out there they are going to play out on these guys for, for the coming quarters. The big risk is, did they get everything out there this quarter, or are they going to guide down again in a quarter or two to come? Hopefully, they they threw out the kitchen sink this past quarter, but but it's always possible that they come out next quarter and things don't look uh, quite as good as maybe they hoped, and they guide back down again. If that's the case, well, you know the stock may see uh, tougher days ahead. But you know, I mean, it's a good business, it's a growing business, it's a profitable business, it's cash flow positive business, a lot of good things here, uh, and, and they are clearly building a platform that consumers uh, or that that their customers like and are using. Uh, so I, I wouldn't get too worked up over it. Um, you know, wasn't one the greatest quarter in the world, but it wasn't as bad as I think the market would have you uh, believe. So there we go with earnings. I think uh, let's take a look here real quick. I want to tap into Twitter as we do every week. Uh, always, always some good stuff out there being said and questions being asked. And I'll look here first at cricket nine nine two three eight. Uh, he says, "Wonderful episode, and love the insights on Synchrony. Definitely one that I can, uh, definitely one that I'm going to watch closely. Thanks for the education. That was Niraj, and uh, so I think you really caught his attention. There was Synchrony, Matt. Good job. Glad to do it. And that's <laughs> another company I met with at Money 2020. Which, nice. by the way, I'm convinced that Vegas is the most cash friendly city in America. <laughs> Ironically, that they hold a payments conference there, just because people can't gamble with cards." So everybody has cash. So all the businesses there are just used to cash. Seems so to make sense. Cash is everywhere in Vegas. <laughs> Ironic that they have a cashless payment conference. Uh, well, last week, <laughs> yeah, of course, we had a lot of volatility in the markets. And on October 26th, uh, long term investor, Twitter handle at GBP underscore HS. Said on days such as these, one needs all three of cash, courage, and conviction. If any one of the three is missing, the correction will be a wasted opportunity. And I couldn't agree more. Always nice to have some dry powder, but it does you no good if you don't have the courage and conviction to actually hit the buy button. So make sure you have a watch list there with the companies you really have high convictions on so that when we have these. Well, let's face it. It seems like these corrections are happening just they're they're, they're just really quick. You know, maybe a couple of days you see the market a little bit a little bit of volatility in there, and then in the next couple of days it's it's back on the way up. But uh, yeah, be able to take advantage of those uh, down days because you don't know how long they're going to last. And uh, Rick Zabrodsky at R Zabrodsky. This is I call him Doctor Rick. It's good good tweet here. He said I'm investing for 30 years, buying on dips. Biggest mistake was selling anything. I now have numerous 20 plus baggers and dividend stocks paying 20 percent plus based on his initial cost. Buy and hold also means I am diversified in sectors, size, geography, growth, and dividends. Stay the course. I thought this was a great tweet because really you got you got a guy out here who's lived it, who's done it. And this is a lot of great advice from someone who's who's seeing the benefits of what he's what he's preaching right here. So thanks for that, Doctor Rick. And uh, lastly, uh, you know, last week I had a chance to to go on to CNBC and talk with him a little bit about some of our. Um, some of our favorite uh, payment companies and uh, a tweet here from at every ninety Midwest. He said the important question: Were you wearing pants? 
And yes, yes, Adam, I was wearing pants. And just for a little backstory there, sometimes here in the summertime, you know, we don't have a dress code here at the Fool, so you can wear shorts. Um, if I'm doing a you know a press uh, spot here or something from the studio here, well, I may just put on the suit top and leave the shorts on, right? I mean, it's I call that the wardrobe mullet, right? Because it's your business up top and you get the party going on down below. I mean, if they're just shooting the camera from the tie level up, there's no reason to really worry about having pants on. But I have pants. They're just shorts. I'm not I going. I confess, during the summer, I've done the same. Okay, well, I just want to be very clear. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing pants in one way or another, but this one was at their studio, so I most definitely was wearing pants. Good question there, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, hey, Matt, let's go ahead and wrap it up here with one to watch. Give our listeners something to focus on for the coming week because we still have more companies out there reporting. What's your one to watch this coming week? Oh, I'd say mine is, is Green Dot, the one I mentioned. Um, Every I, the more I hear about the company and the more I kind of dig into it, the more I like it as a long term investment. So nothing particularly newsworthy coming in the next week. It's just the one that's really on my radar right now. And the ticker, G D O T. All right, um, I'm going to be watching out for Fiserv earnings. I believe those are coming up Wednesday. Ticker is F I S V. Uh, this is an interesting payments company because they are. I think their customer base primarily is financial institutions. But again, it's it's finance, it's tech, it's it's really taking advantage of that space, and I think uh, playing a big role in in sort of a behind the scenes nature uh, as opposed to some of those other names that we see uh, in, in fintech every day. Uh, uh, so we'll we'll make sure to go through that quarter and have an update for you next week, uh, folks. Remember, you can always reach out to us via email at industryfocus@fool.com. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at MF Industry Focus. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the Motley Fool's newly renovated, very slick looking YouTube channel, where you'll find clips from all of our podcasts in the Foolish Family. This one included. Just go to YouTube.com/slash The Motley Fool. Matt, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for joining us. Really great stuff from Vegas. Appreciate everything. Of course. Always glad to be here. All right, bud. Well, we'll look forward to next week. And as always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about. The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. The show is produced by Austin Morgan. For Matt Frankel, I'm Jason Moser. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.